I'm so thankful that we are able to connect and I'm able to share this challenge with you. My name is John Barnett and my wonderful wife Bonnie is right over there in the Switcher studio and she is going to be going between all the different cameras and the slides and going to capture this to send it to you. But our topic, and, and this is what I would like to share with you from the Word of God. Uh, it says in Matthew chapter 28, what we all know, you as evangelists and for me as a pastor and a teacher, it says that the 11 disciples, verse 16 of Matthew 28, went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. And I love the next three words, but some doubted. What's wonderful is, and you can see I have it written up here on the board, that Jesus has a wonderful promise in Matthew 28, but we have a challenge. And like them, sometimes we doubt. Uh, this is a very hard time for us in America since January 6th. And by the way, it's uh, Thursday, February 25th right now, early in the morning. But since January 6th in the United States in that horrific riot that was at our capital of our country in Washington, D.C., there has been a kind of a crystallization of hostility against things that are conservative, biblical, and against kind of general opinion. So in the UK, there, there are a lot of challenges to the gospel. In America, in the world, there are challenges to the gospel. So that's what our topic is today. If you look at the slide, we're looking at making disciples. That's, that is exactly what Jesus left us all to do in a hostile world. And look at this, from the first century, it was very hostile in the first century, and for Bonnie and I, uh, we're so excited to teach you as the gathered evangelists of the UK Evangelistic Association. As we come to your gathering and share what God has laid on your heart, I've entitled the conference, Making Disciples in a Hostile World in the First Century, that's the biblical pattern, and today, where we follow that pattern. And then, see on the right here, following Jesus hasn't changed for 2,000 years. What we're doing as we study the Word of God is exactly what Jesus taught. He promised us in Matthew 28. And in Matthew 28, his promise is this, especially if, if you have your Bibles, look there, look at verse 20. Teach them to observe all things I've commanded, and lo, look at that, I am with you always. What's our challenge? Like I said, uh, the disciples doubted, and sometimes we doubt. We doubt whether we can really make an impact with all the lockdowns, with all the isolation. But see, following Jesus hasn't changed for 2,000 years. They had all kinds of challenges back then, just like we have today. But secondly, after his promise, we have his plan. And we're going to look at specifically the plan Jesus has to keep us doing what he left us to do and how he ensures our success is his power. And that's where we're going to conclude in Revelation chapter 3. So our theme for this conference, following Jesus, hasn't changed for 2,000 years. We're going to revisit his promise. We're going to remember always we're challenged as humans in our weakness and frailty. And we're going to remind ourselves of his plan and the power that flows from it. Now, in the next slide, his promise is contained in the Great Commissions. Notice that S on the end. Isn't it interesting that Jesus commissioned his church in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John chapter 20, and really repeated and, and amplified it in Acts chapter 1. The Great Commissions... Jesus makes an astounding promise. Verse 20, I am with you always. Jesus is personally supervising the spread of the gospel. Now, look up from your slide for a second. Let me remind you something. When Jesus said here in verse 20, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, that means that Jesus is personally supervising all of our evangelistic efforts. Now, one thing that's, that's very amazing for me is evangelism. It says in Ephesians 4 that God gives to his church gifts. And those gifts are 
apostles, prophets. Now look, those of you gathered in this conference, you're next. Evangelists. And then there's another group, pastors and teachers, which actually in Greek is like a hyphenated word, pastor, teacher. And so these apostles and prophets were foundational. We don't have apostles, we don't have prophets in the New Testament sense. We don't have anybody that when they speak, they're actually speaking with the voice of God on the authoritative level, equal with the Word of God. We don't have those anymore. We don't have anybody speaking the Bible and the authoritative, scriptural, inspired truth of God. Now, we have those who, who declare it and teach it, what's already written down, but we don't have any new revelation coming. And so these apostles and prophets were for the foundational time of the church. But look at this. There are two groups, gifted groups, gifts to the church from Jesus Christ left. Evangelist, that's someone who, who has what many of you, I'm sure, have. This burning desire, this, this unquenchable thirst to share the gospel with people. I just got a note from one of the churches where I served. And one of the young men that I discipled and prayed with and, and spent so much time with, even during the lockdown, has been finding ways in America to go with all of the rules being followed, the mask and the distance and everything, and sharing hope in Jesus Christ. Now, most Christians are kind of not witnessing right now very much because they feel with all the rules, they, they don't see people. They aren't in contact enough. But an evangelist is always finding a way. And then there are pastors and teachers. So for you as evangelists, Jesus is personally supervising you just as all of us who aren't evangelists. By the way, I don't believe I'm a gifted evangelist. I'm one of these. I do the work of, the, of evangelism. I share the gospel. I always pack my track and pray over it in my wallet. This is my wallet. And this is my gospel track. See it? I'll show you a slide of it soon. Uh, but this is the current one I use because my old favorite, this one, which is called Knowing God Personally, which I love and have used for years, is now hard to get. It's almost out of print. But this one is pretty easy. These cost 10 cents each, and it's called The Promise of Heaven. Now, I know you have whatever resource you like, but for all of you that are joining this conference more widely on our channel and YouTube, and remember, this conference will be available for you on YouTube. And you just go to uh, DTBM or Discover the Book on YouTube. But this track I pray over, I put in my wallet, and I say, Lord, give me an appointment. Now for me, because I'm not a gifted evangelist, it's the work, Paul said to Timothy, of evangelism. It's hard. And so I pray that as I'm studying and, and discipling and, and ministering to the church, that the Lord would give me appointments out there as I come into contact with people to share the gospel. So the Great Commission's back looking at this slide is a reminder that Jesus is personally supervising the spread of the gospel in this world through each generation. Always remember this. It's the duty of each generation to reach their generation with the gospel. That's what Jack Wurtzen always used to say. So if we just follow his plan, the Lord Jesus Christ, he always triumphs through us. And Christ's plan is clear. And that's what we're going to study today in this biblical challenge to share the gospel. Now, in this next slide, I want to remind you of our challenge. Now, we're going to look at Christ's promise and Christ's power. His promise is he's going to be with us. His power we're going to see in Revelation 3. But what's our challenge? Our challenge is we're living for God in a very dangerous world. And what do I mean by that? Well, look at this slide. The, the Great Commission... Christ's promise of being with us was given just before he returns to heaven. And then we have that first generation church, the one we read about in the book of Acts. And wow, they were amazing. And we kind of think we could never be like them. But they were living for God in a very dangerous world. 
Sharing Christ has always been hard. Nothing infuriated the religious leaders of Jesus' day more than when he claimed to be the Messiah, Jesus Christ the Lord. They killed him. Then the wider leaders of the Roman Empire's furthest reaches hunted down the Twelve. They martyred or exiled them all. So facing hostility today is nothing new. Neither are the divine resources, what Jesus offers to us. The same Holy Spirit's power that raised Jesus from the grave, right here at the launch, is the same power that empowered the apostles as they founded that first generation church, that ignited the church in the book of Acts, and has just kept the gospel flames burning since. Jesus gave an amazing promise in one of his final letters to the seven churches. And if you take your Bibles and start turning to Revelation 3, this promise crystallizes his plan for the past 2,000 years. And what Jesus said is that he set before them and all of us through the centuries an open door. So what we're looking at on the chart here is the second generation church. And what we see in Revelation where we're headed, chapter 3, is when Jesus comes back, visits the church. Remember, he, he ascended to heaven here, but he comes back unseen by the church, invisible. Remember, he visits John on Patmos, John sees him, but the churches don't. But Jesus visits all the churches of Asia Minor. Now, this next slide shows you a picture of him. Here are the, the seven churches that, that Jesus See them from Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis. Now, this is the one we're going to read about. Philadelphia. And then, of course, the notorious Laodicea. But look where they are. Uh, they're right here in the Roman province of Asia. The, Revelation 3, where we're headed, is the church of Philadelphia, smack dab, as we say here in America, in the middle of the most hostile part of the Roman Empire. Jesus said, even there, in the epicenter of your Roman, secular, pagan, hostile world, I have set before you an open door. Each of us have an open door Jesus has placed in front of us. And our lifelong joy is to walk through that door and share the gospel that we're living. By the way, that's why Philadelphia was the only church that got a glowing commendation and no criticism from Christ. Why? They were spiritually healthy. Now, in the next slide, I want to show you what we're going to walk through now in Revelation 3. So make sure you're there uh, in your Bibles, because I want to point out these things to you. Notice the repeated he, 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 he. See that? Jesus refers to himself four times, and he says, I open and no one shuts, I shut and no one opens. So he's declaring a uh, revelation of his character and revealing, tying to the Old Testament. Uh, then he says this. Now this is interesting. Before he talks about their ministry of evangelism, this open door, he says, I know what's going on inside of you. Your lives, your, your character, how you're relating to one another in the church. I know your works, Jesus said. And because of that, he says, I have set before you an open door. Wow. Revelation chapter 3 reminds us by this repeating of he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, what it says in verse 7, that, that a life that shares the gospel is anchored to Christ. He's the center of everything. Think about what the apostle John is, is recording when he writes these words to the early church. He's telling them that, that their church was able to have this open door before them because they had chosen to live a life anchored to Christ. Now, look up here. The promise of Jesus in the Great Commission was that he would be with us always. He would be the one that, that is supervising and empowering and, and encouraging our evangelistic efforts. But what is his plan to keep that going? Now, look at the slides. How do we keep living this way? 
His plan is our spiritual health. The only way that that you as evangelists can share the gospel, the only way that all of us as, as gifted believers knowing Jesus Christ can share the gospel is being spiritually healthy. See this? It's the key to his power for reaching a hostile world. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. We'll come back to chapter 3 but in, in, uh, of Revelation. But look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 24, is the Lord's plan for our spiritual health. And this is what Jesus said he wanted to go on in the early church. You remember I showed you the, that first generation church? Well, this is the epistles and the message and the teaching they'd gotten, we are to consider one another how to stir up love and good works. Now, look up and I'm going to read, but listen to what God communicated through the writer of Hebrews. And let us consider one another. It's an interesting Greek word. We're supposed to be looking. You know how some people are uh, home maintenance people and they're always looking at the roof and making sure that you know everything is right, the windows, the trim, whether or not the weather ceiling. They're always considering the health of the house. Other people are car mechanic types and they look at cars and they say, oh, that one's not running properly. That's the word. Someone that, that doesn't just see things in a glance, but they're examining them. Look at verse 24. Let us Consider, examine, really look at one another. Here it is, in order to stir up. See on the slide? How do we stir up others to love and good works? In other words, to do what God left us to do. Well, here, in the next slide. How do we live full of God's power, that is to share the gospel, and get stirred up in 2021? Well, I call it, we need to get back to the basics. And if, if I could challenge you who are gathered here at this conference, and if I could challenge all of you who are attending this conference later, you couldn't come and, and you're watching this video on YouTube, it would be get back to the basics. Now, I've written down here on the slides, look up, I'm talking about the plan of Jesus in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And look at this. There are four parts. If we want to live full of his power, we need to be stirred in the basics, the basics of the Christian life. You know what's amazing? It's so simple. There are four things that keeps a believer healthy. They have to eat right. They have to chew their food. They have to keep breathing. You know, don't hold your breath. Because you hold your breath, you pass out and get lightheaded. And they need to go. What is that? The four basics. Look at your slides. And I want to explain these to you. Number one, we need to eat. That's time listening to God by feeding on his word. That's reading the scriptures. As we read them, number two, we chew on them. Uh, chewing is meditation. Applying God's word to my life. It's, it's every time we read, we find verses we want to memorize so that we can meditate on them all day long. You know, this morning, so that I could gather with you on Thursday afternoon, I had to get up at 4 a.m. And did you know, as I was up at 4 a.m., I was chewing on the Word of God. I was going through the scriptures that I have memorized and, and just thinking through them. And, and the Lord just kept blessing me with what he's already said to me. Now, back at the slide, eating is time listening to God, reading the scripture, chewing is digesting all that. Thirdly, breathing, you know, as natural as breathing is prayer. Did you know we're supposed to pray without ceasing? Think about, don't ever hold your breath. Holding your breath means you're on your own. Breathing means I need God. I'm talking to God. How much we pray reflects how much we need God. And so we are to be constantly breathing in and out in prayer, saying, Lord, help me, strengthen me, illumine me, help me to see the opportunity as we, number four, the fourth basic is going. That's talking to others about God's plan of salvation. That is a life of witnessing and winning souls, which is wise. Now, those four are aided by little tools. You see, I told you I'd show you a picture. This is my current track I have in my wallet. It's called the Promise of Heaven track. 
written by Bible teacher John MacArthur. You can get 25 of them online. I just typed into Google, uh, went just to check last night. I went to Google and I, I typed in Promise of Heaven track. I didn't even put MacArthur. Boom. All the places that sell it came up. And of course, they charge more for shipping than they do for the tracks, but you know what I mean. And I don't say that, that that's the only track. I, I use any good, solid gospel track, but always a tip from me. As a 50-year sharing the gospel veteran, I take my track and I pray over it and I say, Lord, I ask you for a divine appointment. Make it so clear you're working in their hearts so I can share this gospel message. And then with this one, which has the, you know, the cross across the chasm, it's got all the pictures, the one that's called Knowing God, or the promise of heaven, I just start sharing it with them and give that to them when I get done. And I even will give them my email address and write it on it when I give it to them. But back to the slides, arm yourself with whatever works with you. But remember the basics. We're supposed to be eating and, and what that means is that we are supposed to be finding someone. Now, now look up from the slide. Let me tell you this. Do you know how to make this promise of Jesus and the Great Commission work? By following his plan. Did you know the Christian life is not lived well in isolation? That's why this whole COVID, you know, isolation of everybody's social distancing is so hard. So what we have to do is find creative ways. I have a friend, he's pastoring uh, up in northern UK, just below the Scotland uh, border there. And in his church, he has organized everyone, and they are on WhatsApp, and they're, they each share, look at this, what they're reading in the Bible. Now look back at the slide. We should have someone asking us, what are you reading and feeding your soul upon from God's word? And we should be asking them the same. We should be saying to people when we see them, what are you memorizing and meditating upon from God's word? If they're not eating and chewing, they're not healthy. And we should be alarmed about that. Thirdly, we should say, what are you praying and beseeching God for? Are you asking God for something in your life, uh, for opportunities, for overcoming struggles? And finally, who are you seeking to share the gospel with? Well, the next slide, and this is when we're, we're going to get into uh, the book of Revelation. This is only accomplished by his power. See, evangelism and the Christian life is anchored to Christ. But Revelation 3 gives us four truths of a life that's been forever changed to reflect Christ. Now back up here on my marker board, what I want to show you is this. Revelation 3, 7 and 8 connects together all that we're looking at. Jesus promised in the Great Commission that he would go with us and supervise us and, and constantly help us to accomplish sharing the gospel with all those he lays before us. If you're a gifted evangelist, you're always looking for new groups. If you're doing the work of an evangelist, like all the rest of us, you're constantly praying for appointments. But how do you keep fresh, bold, empowered by that plan? Eating, chewing, breathing in prayer, and going. But when we do that, we're assured of the power of Jesus. Now this... This is what I want to dive into with you in Revelation 3 for this reason. What's going on is, do you remember Jesus ascended back, the first generation church, the book of Acts, then the epistle time, and we get to the second generation church. That's what Revelation, when we're looking here at Revelation 3, we're looking at those, those second generation Christians. The, most of them, other than the aged apostle John, most of them had never, never met Jesus personally. They were like us. They heard about him from someone else and read about him in the scripture, but never saw him with their own eyes. And so they have the challenge of believing and, and obeying all of these promises in the plan. And they, in Revelation 3, experienced what I call 
the power of Christ. Now, look at the slides. This is what we're seeing in Revelation 3. And I'll just stick with the slides so you can see um, real big what I'm talking about. These are the four truths. And, and there aren't many truths that can change your life forever. We learn a new skill on our computer or in our sports. It can change how we do things. We learn a new fact. It might change how you think. But right here in Revelation 3, uh, verses 7 and 8, Jesus lists four truths that can change your life forever. And Jesus introduces himself with these truths. First, he says, I am the one who is holy. Then he said, I am the one who is true. Then he said, I am the one who has the key of David. And he said, I am the one who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I'm the one that's supervising your life. I'm watching you all the time. I know what's going on. And I have set before you an open door. In this next slide, he continues. He says, you have a little strength. You're not a big church. You're not a big congregation. You aren't super, super, you know, apostles or something. But you've kept my word. <laughs> That's the Hebrews 10. You're stirred up. You're eating and chewing and breathing and going. And you have not denied my name. You've kept. See, you've kept my command. Next slide. Verse 11. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one can take your crown. Remember why we do this. We have an unfading crown that the Lord is going to give us for faithfully serving him. Look at this. He says, he who overcomes. Now, wait a minute. You say overcomes. What's that? Well, Jesus promises. He gives them a unique promise. He said, he who overcomes. That's someone who truly lives the Christian life. By the way, the, the New Testament says that an overcomer equals a Christian. Uh, it's, it's someone, uh, I can't write very well, my iPad is moving, but a Christian. An overcomer is a Christian. But look at the promise, he says. I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. Now just look at those words and think about this. This is the most amazing promise. It's permanence, rest, security forever. Wow. There are more promises, more blessings, and more insights about Jesus in this little section of Revelation 3, 7 through 11 than anywhere else I know of in the Bible. Everybody builds their life on something. Jesus said, you build your life on me, and I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple of my God. I'm going to write on you the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and I'm going to write on you a new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to, look what this is, it's plural. The churches. This was written to all the geographic churches in the first century. It was also written to all the churches throughout all the ages and that includes us today. And what, what did the Lord say? Number one, live for, for him who is holy. And Jesus calls himself holy. By the way, this is the only attribute that is emphasized ultimately. This is the only attribute of God that gets the holy, 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 the threefold emphasis. It says in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy. See, the only way to have the power, look, look up here, the only way to, to see that promise of Jesus fulfilled in the Great Commission, the only way that we can live out that plan of Jesus to stir one another up, and the only way we can experience the power of Jesus is if we live for the one who is holy by being holy too. You shall be holy, Jesus said, as I am holy. The essence to the power of the Holy Spirit is not some emotional exuberance, but an absolute surrender to live the sanctified Christian life. What's that? That I am set apart by God and I refuse all the things that quench and grieve and displease my holy God. Back down to the slides. Not only is this the only attribute that gets the ultimate, but secondly, Jesus says, live for him who is true. Do you remember what Jesus said in, in verse 7? 
He says, I am the one who is holy and true. He is holy, cannot lie. He is uncorrupted. He can't fail. He's the only source of unblighted existence. So that, what does that mean for us? Well, Jesus speaks truth. He's the last word on everything. Now, look up from the slide for a second. Let me tell you something that you can relate to. Bonnie and I had the privilege of leading a woman to Christ on the London tube. She was on the subway. She was coming back for three decades. She had lived a life of alcohol-fueled, drug-fueled, immorality, promiscuous, partying, going to the concerts, trying to, to get a guy that would you know, spend the weekend with her drinking and drugging and, and having sex. That was her life. And she was riding the tube in London, going to work. After another weekend, after 30 years of living that way, and inside she said, I don't have hope. So she was fiddling around on her, her cell phone, her smartphone, and in Google she typed hope. Hope. And for some reason, I don't know why. Well, I do know why. God orchestrated that. She got to a YouTube clip that I posted called Season of Hope, and it was just a six minute long challenge at the end of a concert. And, and I guess it said Concert of Hope. Maybe she was coming from a concert and that might have been the word she put in. But what she said to me is she said, sitting on the tube, she started watching that clip and I started sharing the gospel and I said, Jesus Christ is the only one who speaks truth. He is the only one who gives life. He wants to give you abundant life that never runs out. You'll never be empty. You'll never be dry. You'll never be hopeless. You'll never be guilty. You'll never feel totally defiled, which is what she felt. And I said, why don't you just bow your head right now? You know what she did? On the tube, sitting in her little bench, shared with someone else or right next to someone else, she bowed her head with her earbuds in. And I said, why don't you just raise your hand to let Jesus know that you want him to come to you right now. He's not far. And I, I quoted Acts 17 that said, Jesus is within an arm's length of each of us. That's what Paul said. He said, if you'll reach out to him, he is not far. In Greek, he's within an arm's length. You can reach him if you reach out by faith. And you know what she did? On the tube in London, she raised her hand. Can you imagine all the other riders? She had her eyes closed, probably doesn't know if anybody even saw it. Probably everybody else was on their cell phone playing games or watching movies, and they didn't. But right there, she reached out. Now, why she wrote to me is this. And look back at your slide. Jesus speaks truth. He's the last word on everything. I told her that if you connect with Jesus Christ, he'll completely transform your life. Look up from your slide. Guess what? She wrote me and said, it was six months ago I raised my hand on the London tube. She said, I just came in from going to the trash bin. She said, all of my album covers that I kept track of every concert that I'd ever gone to and all of my, you know, Revel, re, revelous living, you know, living in, in sin. She said, I, I had all those on my walls in my apartment. She said, I just took all those down. I don't even like all that anymore. She said, I haven't been to a concert in six months. She said, I, I stopped drinking. I stopped drugging. I stopped immorality. She says, all I'm doing now is, she says, I'm, I'm studying the Bible. She said, I, I found a, a group of people, uh, a church to go to. Do you know what happened to her? She said, Jesus kept his word. He's changed me from the inside out. I'm a new creation in Christ. I've gotten rid of all the trophies of the devil that used to line my apartment. She said, I am not living for the cheap thrills of the concert weekends. She says, I have abundant life. Back down to your slides. Jesus speaks the truth. All we need to do is share it. Jesus said, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. And the truth sets us free. And it's the free gift of eternal life. And we go living the truth that sets us free and sharing that truth with others. Thirdly, we live for him that holds the key. That's what it says in Revelation 3, 7. 
And basically, this key, and, and I'm not going to spend the time to go to the Old Testament, but in Isaiah 22, 22, the key of David referred to here in Revelation 3 was the steward of the king of Israel that, that held kind of the, the entry for all of the king's life. You know, if, if the steward, he served the king by dispensing the king's wealth, if you needed something from the king of, of Israel, or the access to the king's presence if you needed a meeting, or the steward displayed the king's power, like Genesis 41 with Pharaoh, kind of Joseph like that, that's what a steward was. But look at this slide. Jesus said, I have the key of David. I'm God's steward. I can give to you God's wealth. I can open God's presence to you anywhere, just like the lady on the tube. I can give you God's power so that you can see lives transformed like they did in Acts. We can see today. Truth number four. We live for him. Revelation 3, 7 D says, who opens and no one can shut. Now, the first thing that the Lord opens is the door for us to share the gospel. But Jesus, when he said this opens and no one shuts, he's kind of reminding us of what he said all the way through his ministry. What's that? Well, in John 4, 14, next slide, Jesus says this. Let, let me read it to you. Jesus said, whoever drinks the water I will give him will never thirst. Two chapters later. Look at chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus is the only one that can open the door to eternal satisfaction. He doesn't run out. It's like the concert's over. It's never over with Jesus. He doesn't run dry. He fills us over and over. And no one can take that from us. Now look at chapter 8, verse 12 on the slide. Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall... Same word, Greek word, never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Listen to this. When Jesus opens the door to eternal light, no one can shut the door. Not me, not someone else. Do you know what hell is described as? The blackness of darkness forever. The first two never shuts doors, Jesus opens. The door to eternal satisfaction and the door to eternal light. You know what? Look up from your slide. We've got to live that. We should be the most satisfied, joy-filled, overflowing people in the world. My wonderful wife, she's sitting over there going between the slides and the cameras helping me. We, when we, we just did it this morning, at breakfast we read our Bible together. We have a lifelong habit since we got married in 1983. We read the Bible together aloud. And we do this wherever we go. And we were sitting in Germany. Uh, I was on my way to ministry, and Bonnie and I were checked into our hotel, and we sat and we read the Bible at supper. And guess what? After we got done reading, talking, eating, a couple from a nearby table came over and said, Hey, can we come sit with you? We said, Sure. I mean, we were, we were riding the trains. We were, you know, wearing our, our uh, travel clothes. They were all dressed up for dinner. And they sat at our table and they said, we've watched you for two hours. Your lives are tranquil. That was the only English word. They were from Strasbourg. Tranquil was the only English word they could think of. They said, could you tell us why you're tranquil? Do you know what they were asking us? Look back at, down at the slide. We had eternal satisfaction. We were walking in the light. Next slide. The last door that Jesus opens is the best one. It's the door to endless life. In your Bibles, look at that first uh, reference there on the slide, John 8, 51. Jesus said, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And then in, in chapter 10, verse 28, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then 1126, Jesus said, uh, that, that he is the one who, the, if you keep my word, you'll never see death. If you keep my word, you'll never taste death. I'll give you eternal life, you'll never perish. And you, whoever lives in me, John eleven twenty six, 26, will never die. The last door Jesus opens is the door of endless life. Here's my conclusion for you, because I know uh, 
that you don't have endless time, and, and I know I'm fitting into your conference, but Jesus isn't looking for absolute perfection. He's just looking for us to be faithful. How are we faithful for him? We just live a healthy life. Jesus offers to all believers an abundant, confident, joyful, guilt-free, peaceful, hope-filled, overflowing, purpose-filled life of faithfulness. Next slide, I just want to share the power of the gospel. I call it Flight, flight 961. I was sitting in my office uh, as a pastor early on, and this is what happened, and you can look up from your slide. A missionary that our church supported over in Ethiopia sent me a text, I mean a fax, shows how old it was. That's a machine that has paper and it prints on it. It was before email and before texting and everything. But as a young pastor, I was sitting there, and just before Thanksgiving, it was November 23rd, 1996, so it was 25 years ago, the fax machine started, tick, 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 and, and this fax came out. So I tore it off and I read it. Can I read to you? I'm going to look down and read to you the example of what you and I have the power through the promise of Jesus and his plan. We have his power to see him open the door of salvation to people around us. Flight 961. It was a typical flight. This is what the facts said. One that occurs thousands of times every day is around the world. Ethiopian Air Flight 961 took off November 23, 1996 from Addis Ababa. On board were 163 passengers and 12 crew members. Among those flying that Saturday were Mr. and Mrs. Andy Meekins. Andy was an elder at the International Evangelical Church of Addis, the largest Bible-believing church pastored by that missionary that we supported. And that's why he faxed this to me. In less than two hours, more than 120 people died on that flight, including five from Andy's church that never survived the crash. Somewhere near Kenya, the hijack began. An unidentified number of men declared themselves escaped convicts, and they were going to take that flight to Australia. From Ethiopia to Australia, a third of the way around the world. After savagely beating the co-pilot and throwing him down, they proceeded to order the plane to turn toward the east. Despite the nearly empty fuel tanks, they forced the pilot to continue. With dangerously low supplies, the pilot tried to plead for a refueling stop to no avail. He tried to hug the coast, but the hijackers, as it became evident, threatened to blow up the plane. So the pilot sought to make it to the Indian Ocean island of Comoros. When it became evident they would not make it, Captain Leo Abate announced on the speaker to the passengers, listen guys, we're all dead. There's no argument now. People began to scream. One witness said others just sat in their seats crying. The crash is now well known. It was captured on the film of Japanese honeymooning couple. They caught the descent of the 767, the dip of its wing. As the wing caught the ocean, it flipped and crashed and disintegrated over the water. What the news reports never reported was what was in that fax that I got the same week. It was the inside the cabin account of Andy Meekin's wife, one of the few who survived on that plane. This is what she read to the church and that pastor faxed to me. As soon as the captain told us we were going to crash, she said, I heard the distinct snap of my husband's seatbelt. He was up and out of his chair. He started going down the aisle row by row, sitting on the arms of the chairs of each bank, looking down at each group of people sitting there. And he earnestly shared the gospel of Christ with any of the people on each row that would listen to him. Before the sickening screech of twisting metal, the crash of our plane into the water that snuffed out, Andy's earthly pilgrimage, his wife wrote. He had led 20 of the passengers to Jesus Christ for their salvation. She said that Andy would... would 
talk to the people and then look back up the aisle and say, one of them came to Christ. And then he talked more and said, the second one. And she said he kept doing that until the last time she saw him, he went like this, 20 of the people of the people down the aisle he talked to had received Christ. This is how she concluded. Andy never made it back to the safety of his seatbelt, but he took 20 souls with him to paradise. You see, there was a safe spot on that airplane, a shelter no twisted wreckage would permanently harm, a haven no crushing impact could erase. Andy knew that, and he shared the divine directions. Wow. Are you sharing the gospel with people around you? Do you know how to do that? Those of you at this conference sure do. Others of you watching this, you need to learn. Use a, a tool. Find someone to mentor you. Start sharing the gospel. Okay, let's go back to the slides before we go. Next slide. We're to be making disciples of Jesus in a hostile world. They did it in the first century. We're supposed to do it today, and things haven't changed. Bonnie and I, I thank you for letting us come to your conference, and I thank you for listening to this video. That's my wonderful wife, Bonnie, who is running the soundboard and the audio board. We serve in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, Central Europe, and across Asia. We equip and mobilize partners reaching the least reached peoples, and it's our joy to come to you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I pray that we would seek the basics to stay spiritually healthy. I pray that we would eat your word every day, and that we would have someone in our life that asks us, what have, what have you eaten today in the word of God? And that we would chew on it all day long, and that we would ask those around us, what are you meditating on and being transformed by? And then that we would be constantly, without ceasing, breathing out to you in prayer, asking for you to cleanse and fill and use us, and then help us to go into all the world and share the gospel. That's what you left us here to do. 2,000 years ago, you commissioned us. You gave us your promise that you would be with us. You shared the plan that we're to stir each other up. And then you said, I will empower you. And you are. Thank you, O oh Lord, for letting us be a part of the greatest work on this planet. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Encourage your evangelists and all of us to go into all the world today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.